Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at deformation and metamorphic rocks. So in this video we're going to think about what are some of the common metamorphic rocks that you could encounter. And this is going to correspond to section 8.7 of your textbook. So to begin with, before we do this presentation, I really need to point out that this is not an exhaustive list of metamorphic rocks. This is just going to look at a few of the main types but there are actually there's actually a very very wide range of different metamorphic rocks which can appear so please bear that in mind now another term which I you're going I'm going to use over the next couple of slides is going to be the term metamorphic grade so metamorphic grade simply says how much temperature and pressure has your rock been exposed to so if your metamorphic rock has been exposed to relatively low temperatures and pressures we'll typically refer to it as a low grade metamorphic rock if your metamorphic rock has been exposed to high temperatures and pressures, we will typically refer to it as a high-grade metamorphic rock. Now, straight away you're thinking, okay, are there any kind of you know numerical boundaries? The answer is not really. Um, in geology, what we'll do is we'll actually use the minerals that we see to help us define the metamorphic grade. So just like in any situation, there will be certain minerals which will be perfectly happy at lower temperatures and pressures and so these would obviously be present in the lower grade metamorphic rocks. In contrast those minerals will steadily become unstable as the temperature and pressure gets higher so by the time we make it to high grade metamorphic rocks there will be a completely new set of minerals which are present and so as a relatively well trained geologist you can look at these um, minerals and you can say right well I know that these particular minerals will only really exist under very high temperature and pressure conditions and therefore I know this this is going to be a high grade metamorphic rock. Now also when we discuss metamorphic rocks we typically only really talk about the metamorphism of two main rock groups. The first group of rocks which we like to talk about when discussing metamorphism are sedimentary rocks which are very very rich in aluminium silicate minerals especially clays. Now the other group that we'll tend to look for are rocks which are basalts or were basalts originally. The reason for this is is that these two groups of rocks are very prone to changes in the metamorphic minerals as the temperatures and pressures change. And so because we get these changes at different temperatures and pressures, it allows us to track how the metamorphism is progressing over time because we can see these changes in the form of the appearance and disappearance of certain minerals. Now there's obviously going to be lots of other types of rocks, so let's say for instance a rock like granite. Now granite isn't actually particularly good for tracking what's happening with regard to metamorphism because if you take a piece of granite and you increase the pressure and temperature slightly, all that happens is the granite just sits there. So you increase the pressure and temperature some more, all that happens is the granite just sits there, nothing really happens. It's not until you reach very high temperatures and pressures, so high metamorphic grades, that your granite will actually start to metamorphose. So you can see how granite isn't really that helpful with regard to us tracking what's happening when it comes to metamorphism. In contrast, rocks which are ten, which sedimentary rocks which are often quite muddy so quite rich in aluminium silicate minerals and rocks which were originally basalts when they when they were first formed well they will show progressive changes as the degree of metamorphism changes and so they are most useful to geologists when we're trying to track what's going on with regard to metamorphism so just bear that in mind a lot of the time when geologists discuss metamorphism they will be discussing the metamorphism of muddy sedimentary rocks or basalts and that's pretty much where we tend to spend most of our time. So to begin with we're going to look at some of the metamorphic rocks that can form when we metamorphose a sedimentary rock. Now the original rock from which our metamorphic rock is going to form is given a very special term. It's called the protolith. So the protolith is the original rock that's going to be metamorphosed to give us our metamorphic rock. So in this case what we're going to do is we're going to look at the metamorphism of a muddy sedimentary protolith. So this is going to be a sedimentary rock which is very rich in clay minerals. So clay minerals are platy, so they're like a piece of paper. So the crystals are thin but they're broad. 
And so this means when we begin to increase the temperature and pressure, what will start to happen is the pressure will start to make these clay minerals orientate themselves. So we've already discussed how when we take a rock that has platy or, or elongate minerals and we compress it, we can force those minerals to align themselves. And we can see this alignment in this sample of a rock which we refer to as slate right here. So we've ended up forming a cleavage by compressing these clay crystals, these clay minerals. And you can see the cleavage is orientated approximately north-south. And this has simply been because the rock has been compressed approximately east-west. And remember, the cleavage will form at 90 degrees to the direction in which the rock is being compressed. So once again, the cleavage is running top to bottom, so north-south, so that means our rock must have been compressed left to right or east-west. So when this happens, our clay minerals will begin to orientate themselves, and this leads to the formation of a type of uh, metamorphic rock which we refer to as a slate. So slates have a foliation, so they have a cleavage. However, the minerals that make up our rock haven't really changed yet. The temperature and pressure hasn't gotten high enough for the clay minerals to leave their stability field, so they're still perfectly happy. However, the pressure we've applied has forced these clay minerals to reorientate themselves parallel to each other, and this is where the foliation comes from. So slates are a type of clay-rich uh, metamorphic rock which is essentially dominated by the presence of a cleavage and we give this cleavage a very specific term which is a slaty cleavage. Now as the degree of metamorphism increases, so the temperature and pressure is going up, eventually our clay minerals are going to start becoming unstable. So as we start to move to medium grade metamorphic rocks they begin to go, nope, I don't like these conditions, I need to change into a new mineral which is stable at the increasing pressure and temperature. So to do this our clay minerals will typically alter to a group of minerals which we refer to as micas and as we've already touched on we've already come across two common mica minerals muscovite and biotite so biotite as we know is a very dark colored uh, mica mineral it tends to be a, a black or a very dark brown color whereas muscovite tends to be a light silvery color so we can see in this particular rock here our rock is dominated by the mineral muscovite because it has this shiny silver appearance so what's happening is is our clay minerals in our slate are becoming unstable and they are re and they're altering so they're metamorphosing to give us mica minerals which are, are stable at the higher pressures and temperatures so we are metamorphosing our rock even further we're taking it from a low grade metamorphic rock to a medium grade metamorphic rock now mica crystals like uh, like clay crystals are also platy so they're very thin but very broad and so once again bearing in mind that this type of metamorphism will be occurring in an environment where the rocks are being actively compressed the growth of these mica crystals is going to be affected by the compression the fact that the rock is being squished and so as these new mica crystals grow they will grow at 90 degrees to the direction in which the rock is being compressed one more time as our clay minerals alter to give us mica minerals the new mica minerals that develop will naturally grow at 90 degrees to the direction in which the rock is being squished so if we're squishing our piece of rock from top to bottom the mica crystals will naturally grow left to right now we've already touched on the fact that the alignment of these microcrystals is going to give us a very distinctive type of cleavage which we refer to as a schistosity and we know that a schistosity is a type of foliation. Now if we increase the metamorphic grade even further our schist is eventually going to transition to give us a gneiss. So we've already touched on the fact that gneisses are relatively easy rocks to spot because they have this very distinctive light and dark banding. As we've touched on, the dark bands are dominated by ferromagnesian minerals, so minerals which are rich in iron, magnesium and calcium, and the lighter bands are dominated by non-ferromagnesian minerals. These are minerals which are rich in elements like sodium, potassium, silicon and aluminium. And so what will happen is, is our microcrystals will steadily become unstable as the temperature and pressure increases and they will change into new minerals. And those new minerals could be something like another mica mineral, in this case possibly biotite, or it could be another type of mineral such as amphibole.
And so this transition from the schist to gneiss is showing us that we're moving from medium grade metamorphic rocks to high grade metamorphic rocks. And so simply by looking at the metamorphic rocks that we have, and the minerals which are contained within those metamorphic rocks, you can see that we are tracking the steady progression of metamorphism uh, as the temperature and pressure increases. So this is how a geologist is going to be approaching, um, you know, meta uh, going to, uh, this is how a geologist is going to approach the metamorphism of a sequence of rocks. Now we're going to deal with another uh, two types of metamorphic rock which form from sedimentary rocks, but these two types of metamorphic rock do not form from muddy sedimentary rocks. So the first type of uh, metamorphic rock we're going to look at is the type of metamorphic rock which is referred to as a quartzite. And the protolifera quartzite is a sandstone. So in general, quartzites aren't particularly good for tracking metamorphic conditions. That's simply because most sandstones are dominated by the mineral quartz. And to be perfectly frank, when you metamorphose a rock which is rich in quartz, it doesn't really do very much. Quartz is quite a robust mineral. It just sits there and you'll have to increase the pressure and temperature to make it really do anything. So all that can really happen is that our uh, sandstone can be exposed to higher temperatures and pressures, and this can cause the quartz crystals to begin to fuse into each other. And this will take our sandstone, which consists of individual clasts which are cemented together, and it will turn it into a quartzite, where the quartz crystals are actually fused to one another, producing a very strong, very cohesive rock. The other type of metamorphic rock which can form from a, the metamorphism of a sedimentary protolith is marble. So marble forms from the metamorphism of a limestone protolith. So we know that our limestone is typically going to be dominated by the mineral calcite, that's calcium carbonate. And calcite, like quartz, is actually a surprisingly stable mineral. So if you take a piece of calcite and you start increasing the pressure and temperature, all that really happens is your calcite just sits there. It doesn't really do very much. So the only way that we can use lime, uh, sorry, marbles to tell us anything about the metamorphic grade is by looking at how big the crystals are. So typically, as the temperature and pressure increases, so as you go from low grade to metamorphic uh, to medium grade to high grade, the number of crystals in your rock will decrease because the crystals start merging together to form larger calcite crystals. So if we look at this uh, marble right here, we can see quite clearly that there are nice big crystals in it. And so this is going to tell us something about the degree of metamorphism that this particular marble has suffered. And so we can probably say with a reasonable amount of certainty that this marble has been exposed to relatively high metamorphic rates because the crystals are quite big. If in contrast our marble is relatively small crystals, that would tend to suggest that our marble has been exposed to lower uh, temperatures and pressures. But the most important thing is to remember, just like the quartzite, you know, the calcite doesn't really do very much. So it's actually pretty difficult to use the minerals within our marble to say too much about what metamorphic grade our rock has actually encountered. Now, when we talk about the metamorphism of igneous rocks, we are primarily focusing on the metamorphism of basalts. And that's because basalts, when you, metamorphism, when you metamorphose them, tends to give us a nice steady progression in the minerals that we form. And so once again, we know the temperature and pressure conditions at which certain minerals will form. So by when we find these minerals in our metamorphic rock, we can say, right, looking at this mineral, we know therefore that this rock must have achieved this you know, temperature and pressure range. So when we take a basalt and we begin to metamorphose it, the first thing we do is we be begin to cause the ferromagnesium minerals to break down. So the minerals like pyroxene, which are present in our basalt in quite large quantities, and also the mineral olivine, which can be present in variable quantities, will begin to become unstable at low metamorphic grades, and they'll begin to break down. And when they break down, they'll end up forming three rather distinct minerals. One is called chlorite, one is called epidote, and one is called actinolite. And the, th the interesting thing about these three minerals is they are all green in color. 
And so at low to medium metamorphic grades, our basalt will break down and it will metamorphose to give us a type of rock which we refer to as a greenstone because it has a very distinctive green-grey colour, as you can see in the image. Now, if our greenstone takes on a foliation, we actually refer to it as a green schist. So the reason that our greenstone can take on a foliation is because chlorite is a platy mineral, so it looks like a piece of paper. And actinolite is an elongate mineral, so it looks like a pencil. So if you have enough chlorite or actinolite in your rock, you can force them to align themselves, and this will lead to the formation of a foliation or lineation. So our rock will develop a cleavage. And so, once again, if we have one of these uh, low to medium grade uh, metamorphic rocks which forms from a basalt protolith, if it doesn't have a foliation, it will be classified as a greenstone. If it does have a foliation or lineation, we will classify it as a green schist. Now, as we increase the pressure and temperature, the chlorite, the epidote and actinolite are going to begin to become unstable. And so we're going to see them disappearing from our metamorphic rock and they're going to be replaced by a new mineral. And that new mineral is the black mineral that we can see here, hornblende. And so this transition from rocks which are rich in epidote, actinolite and chlorite to rocks which are uh, rich in hornblende, which is a type of amphibole, is showing us the metamorphic grade is steadily increasing. And so we've moved from a you know, low grade to low medium grade metamorphic rock to a medium grade metamorphic rock, which is in the form of amphibolite. Now, amphibolites are relatively easy to identify. They have this very distinctive salt and pepper-like texture, and they will also tend to contain garnet, which we can see here as these red crystals. Now, if we keep uh, increasing the pressure and temperature even further, we are eventually going to cause the amphibole to become unstable, and it's then going to alter to give us the mineral pyroxene. And when this happens, our amphibolite has changed into another type of rock, which we refer to as a granulite. So once again, by tracking the mineral changes, we are keeping track of how the metamorphic conditions are changing as we metamorphose our bas uh, basaltic protolith. Now, the final thing to remember is that we obviously have a very broad range of different rock types. So when we metamorphose these rock types, we are obviously going to end up with metamorphic rocks eventually. But not all rocks will actively metamorphose in, this, in the same way that a muddy sedimentary rock or a basalt will. So as we've already touched on, if you have a piece of granite, it doesn't really do much at low and medium metamorphic grades. It just sits there. Eventually, the granite will begin to metamorphose, but you will only see this occurring at relatively high metamorphic rates. So just bear that in mind. All rocks can be metamorphosed, but only some rocks are actually helpful to geologists in terms of tracking the metamorphic conditions. And those rocks which are most helpful to us are rocks which were either a muddy sedimentary rock or a basalt. All right. Thank you for watching, everybody, and have a good day.